In 2012, you were working with a health and wellness company and your mentor asked you what your why was. And you told him that you wanted to help people get healthier. And he called you out in front of everyone. He said, that's bullshit because you can't help people if you don't help yourself first. And I think that's an amazing lesson that you need to get your life in order before you go out and try and save the world. And so I want to know, George, what actually drives you and what is your selfish why? Um, okay, that's, that's, a, that's an unexpected one. You went really, really back. Um, so yeah, this was a network marketing company. It was, uh, it's still uh, alive today. It's called Juice Plus. Um, and my mentor there, so we were a bunch of kids, right? Me and, a, I don't know, five of my friends or so. And we were trying to finally make it, you know? And um, he kept telling us, he kept telling us the same thing. He kept telling listen, he said, he said, listen, I'm your sponsor, right? So if you make any money, I make money. And still I'm telling you, after everything I've put into you, this guy would answer my phone calls at 3 a.m. And he said, listen, at the end of the day, George and everyone else who were my age were really young, 20 something. He said, listen, at the end of the day, if you don't get your life in order, you cannot do anything else. You're just spinning your wheel on, on, on neutral. And so um, I, I got that, that hit hard. And um, to answer your question today, today, actually, I, I came to Twitter to X now. Uh, I didn't come from inspiration. I, I'll be honest. I didn't come to help people. I didn't come to share my light, you know, my knowledge, my whatever. I came out of desperation. I uh, got married. Six, six days before I got married, I was like, damn, I'll, I'll, I'll have a family now. You know, I have some responsibility. So I need to, to uh, actually start making normal money. So that's, that's, that was my completely selfish why. And then within time, I'm still 100% selfish. I'll not, say, I'll not say I'm not. I want to live a good life. Uh, but along the journey, I just saw how many people I'm, I'm helping. And that actually drives me today a lot more because, you know, I, I can put my business on autopilot, not do this uh, interview with you. I'm making nice money. I have some more businesses. I have clients. I have stuff going on for me. I could just say that's enough and that's it. But at this point, I just want to, I see how much that helps people. And I wish that when I was there 10 years ago, there would be someone like me to share and teach and help. So that's my mission right now. That's how I say it. It's amazing. You tweeted out last week um, from a message that you got in your DMs, uh, a video actually that you received. And it said, yeah. George, I couldn't afford paying $300 for your community. So I had to borrow some money, but I just got paid $3,000 yesterday. And I want to come to Spain just to say thank you. So yeah. this is the type of things that you get when you start to actually put yourself out there, even if it's for selfish gain, let's say in the beginning, when you're, when you're true and you actually deliver value, you change people's lives. What does it feel like to receive messages like that, considering you know, all the ups and downs that you've been through? Sure. So um, uh, if you're in the community, the person who is listening, if you've ever been in the community, you, you will find that in the first uh, videos, in the onboarding videos, when people join, I, I keep saying that hearing about someone's first dollar is much, much, much more enjoyable, not only for me, but for everyone else, um, as comparison to uh, my second million, my third million, my, you know, I made an exit. It's not as, as uh, interesting. It's not, it's not as emotional. So I keep telling people, even if you signed your first client, even if you made your first dollar online, tell it, tell us in the community because you're going to inspire other people. And, and that personally, I'll be honest. I prefer to hear that guy making 3K coming from nothing. That, that guy had to borrow money from his aunt because his parents uh, would say that he's an idiot for paying something online. So that's his, this guy's story. And for me to hear that he uh, got his first 3K, that's, that's like for me saying I did a $300,000 launch. It's on the same emotional level for me. So to me, it's crazy. And I, I get those DMs every single day. This guy just... He uh, showed a video and he lives in a third world country. In there, $3,000 is like in the US having $100,000. Like that's the comparison. Uh, so for me, that's, that's insane. I love those and I get those every single day. Yeah, that's amazing. That's, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit of that. Um, just like the positive feedback, like, hey, I started this. I, I made a progress in this because you inspired me. It's really powerful. It keeps you going. It's important and, and it does bleed into the why over time, I think. Um, there's a lot of ups and downs that you go through in business. That's some of the ups. There's some downs. I know there's a story where, um, you know, you had a friend that you brought into 
a company that you had like built all their marketing systems out and you had known them for about 16 years and inside, at, you know, you guys, I think it was five X the revenue within a couple of months based on the systems that you had put in place. And he kind of turned his back on you and, and told the business that you were no longer necessary and he could run things himself, started using like your ads basically to continue running things. I'm curious, how did that situation impact you and what did you learn and did it change anything about doing business with friends? Um, so obviously we know that doing business with friends is a bad idea. I actually had a business with, with my wife and that uh, was not very successful in terms of our relationship and how it has affected us from that point. So um, logically, I understand that that's something you shouldn't do. Um, but emotionally, I still like to do stuff with friends. You know, I try to separate it a bit, you know, so like, for example, instead of us owning a company together, let's work as two separate companies and provide services for each other or support each other in, in a different way. Because at the end of the day, I think that the person who has the control, and this is, by the way, uh, is a large for business. At the end of the day, the person who has the, the, the product is the person that has all the control. You're never going to be able to have control as long as you're selling someone else's product, regardless of the, of the forms you sign, regardless of the contracts, regardless of everything else, that guy has the power. So what I've learned, and this is also why I'm on Twitter today, is that I have to have my face out there and I have to be the brand. I have to be the, the person who is the brand. Because as long as that's not the case, I had so many business. My last business before I came on Twitter, we made almost a million dollars in sales, cold traffic. Um, in three months, most of it came. And then the girl who was my business partner came and said, we were working on our high ticket. This is from with a $47 product, no upsells, no funnels. Right. And then we started working on a high ticket product with her and we got her a nice office and we bought a microphone and we bought lights and we, bought, we invested so much money. And then after about three months of her recording the high ticket, which would have gotten the business from a million dollars to three or $4 million, like immediately just by having the high ticket ticket uh, product she said hey i don't want to proceed anymore so then overnight my one million dollar business that's it you can do nothing with it you cannot even sell it because her face was on it and she doesn't want to continue so that's when i learned at the end of the day i have to be the face i have to be the brand and along the way you can take as many people with you as you can i'm helping friends i'm paying friends to provide services for me at the end of the day i'm the dictator so to speak i make the final decision it's my face it's my brand and and i think that's important to understand especially if you're working with clients. Yes, yes. And th the power of the personal brand is something that I just continue to harp on uh, on X with my audience. Like it's the, if whether you want financial freedom, location freedom, time freedom, whatever it is, that freedom in your life, if you have the ability to uh, have attention online and be able to just press a few buttons and make some money, you can go anywhere, you can do anything, you can sell anything. It's, it's really the ultimate form, I think, of experience or it allows for the ultimate form of experience as you know, we know the, the world to be today. Um, and because of that, you know, you have to brand yourself in specific ways, um, that are unique and you have a couple of different nicknames that you're known by. One of them is grammar hippie, which is your handle on X. You're very outspoken about the use of commas. Can you explain why you hate commas and what else falls under the, the grammar hippie name? Yeah. So look, um, I'll tell you how this came to be. I'm not the original, original grammar hippie. <clears throat> okay. That's the story behind it. So, um, a year and a half before I came to X, I met a guy who was uh, a sushi delivery guy. Um, he was living with his parents and then every single, uh, dollar that he would make, he would save. He didn't spend any money at, at all. He, he, he used to walk to his job just not to pay for gas or like train or, or whatever. He spent every single do dollar that we, that he had on mentorships. He would get the money, spend it, get the money, spend it. And one of those mentorships that he did was with a friend of mine who is also an ex, by the way, his name is Alex. Um, and Alex is a good friend of mine. I've known him for 16 years or so. And then Alex uh, told me this guy, you see this guy, he's going to make it because just because of his attitude, right? He didn't quit. He didn't, he kept pushing. And then this guy, sometime later, um, we decided to build a business together and we built a sales page together. And um, this guy is dyslexic. So if I, I could show you how he wrote, like just to, to tell you what that actually translated to, we ran cold ads on Facebook and Instagram, Facebook. Every single ad of, of ours had 
thousands of comments of people saying, who is even going to read this? Go to school, learn grammar, right? And then on the back end, each one of those products would make $100,000 in the first month, right? No social proof, no warm audience, nothing, just copy. And then one day we uh, decided to build a business together and we built a sales pitch together. It took us from idea to uh, hitting the publish button for ads, three hours, including design, including everything, three hours. And he did most of the heavy lifting. And then I came to him and I said, hey, what if we change that word? He's like, cool. What if we change that? Uh, you know, I wanted, I'm a perfectionist. I like everything to be perfect. What if we change this? What if, he's like, yes, yes, yes. And then, until I came to one point where I'm like, and what about this? One word. He's like, no. I'm like, wait, you said 20 times. You said, yes, no problem. You were so easy going. Why not? He said, the moment you change that one word, you change the positioning on the product of the product and then everything else doesn't matter. And so I learned from him that it's not about what you write. It's not about how you write. It's not about the words that you use. It's about the thinking behind the words. And so uh, that's what I believe in. I believe in the fact that a sentence, a paragraph, a word, a comma, it doesn't matter. What matters is the thinking behind what you're doing. And specifically about commas, let me tell you two things why I hate commas. Number one is because when you use commas, uh, you make the sentence much, much more difficult to read. And also you make the sentence much longer. And when there are long sentences, people don't like reading long sentences. If and Here's a, an exercise for everyone to do who's watching us, for example. Read out loud the sentence that you wrote. If by the end of the sentence you run out of breath, that's too long. And that's what commas do to your uh, copy, right? But the second reason is because, and, and you know this being who you are on X, uh, we, need, uh, um, we need sort of like um, semantics around our brand. So my brand is grammar hippie. I'm against grammar, one specific thing, because you know, against grammar is not specific enough. So I found out one thing that I actually hate about grammar, which is commas, and I started going against that. There's just, there's just something to connect you with your, with your audience. There's just something that helps you build that brand so that people remember you. I, I get a million comments, replies, DMs every day saying, oh, when I want to use a comma, I think about you. Perfect. That's what I want to do. That's right. See, see and we, the point? Yeah. we talk about that on this podcast. I had Kieran Drew on with the OnlyFans joke. I've had Dakota Robertson on with the pineapple pizza, Eddie Kwan with the watermelon, right? And these are all buddies of yours. And so I totally agree. These are these are inside jokes that you can start to build. I'm starting to incorporate a few of them here and there. And they're really powerful. They really are. Um, when you're just outside in real life and you see a watermelon at the grocery store, and I'm thinking about Eddie Kwan. Like I'm going to yeah. buy his product because of that and, you know, a month down the line, whatever. Um, you mentioned something really important with regards to the copy and that's your other nickname, right? It's copy thinker. And yeah, uh, there's obviously copywriters and then there's copy thinker and it's this idea that you explained where it's not a, as much about the words themselves as it is about the positioning and about understanding human emotion and behavior. Can you unpack that a little bit, how you compare copy thinking and copywriting? Sure. So in my eyes, um, pretty much every single campaign, product, launch, ad, whatever it is, the success or loss of it happens in your head way before it happens in reality. So for example, if, 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 if and we do this in the community a lot, so, um, we do roast Fridays, right? People come for me to roast their ideas. And now I'm not a magician. I cannot look at a sales stage and tell you with complete certainty whether it's going to work or not. But I can find the big idea behind it, the positioning behind it. And if that doesn't make sense, then it's, it doesn't matter how persuasive you are with your copy. It doesn't matter how many power words you use, revealed passive income. It doesn't matter. It means zero if the, if the product is not positioned in the right way. Tell me how deep you want to go into this because I, have, I can say about that a lot. Yeah, I love it. I think people need to understand it because they get caught up on like exactly how to say it. But it's it almost in some ways it's harder, but some ways it's easier to take that step back and remove the pressure of the words that you're using. And it's like, what am I trying to get across? Like, am I speaking from a place of of emotion? Am I speaking of resonance versus just like what I'm typing? So I guess, you know, if you could help people maybe with their X copy or with their sales page copy, like where can they start to kind of tap into those deeper emotions versus worrying so much about the words on the page? So if you ask me at the end of the day, there is two things that you need to take into account. The first thing is, and I teach the thing in the community, it's called the copy thinking triangle, right? The whole idea of that triangle is that we need to understand that 
We don't want to change people's beliefs. We don't want to be better than other products. We just need to be different. And how different? So if you look at that triangle, basically it's three things. It's the market, it's the competitors, and what you're selling. And when you look at those three things, you sort of like see the globe. You see the, the world map. You understand what's happening in your market. And in every single market, and I don't care which market you are, how, how, how saturated it is, doesn't matter. You will find that the market wants something that the competitors are not giving that market, right? And that you, your product can actually deliver. The moment you find that gap that is in the market, that's all you need. That's all you need. From that point, it does not matter almost what you write. I, I can give you an example. We had a product, the one that made uh, almost a million dollars in three months. Uh, this was during COVID. And uh, so we looked at that world map, right? And uh, the creator, she was a designer. Now, if I asked you how, how difficult would it be to sell design courses to call, on cold ads, it's super difficult, right? There's nothing new in that, right? It's just design, right? So we looked at, the, at that world map and we saw, see, when you look at the triangle, it's enough if there's one thing where you find the gap. You don't have to find gaps in all three. One is enough. So one of those things was that uh, it was COVID. And she was uh, teaching design, right? She was a designer. So then you ask yourself a question, who buys design? And what we found is that there's a hungry market out there, influencers, Instagram influencers. Why? Because they cannot go outside while, while they're uh, at the lockdown. They cannot go outside and take those beautiful pictures. So they're stuck without the content. Burning problem, yes, beautiful. Here was, here was our, our, our sales page, just the hook and the first image. And you see that you don't even care to know what happens afterwards. You don't care to see the actual copy. Here was the first line. The first line was, and I'm paraphrasing, secret free apps that you have on your phone that you can design beyond reality photos with uh, in 30 seconds, something like that, right? And then the first image is that girl, she takes a selfie with a washing machine. And then the second picture is, she, same selfie, she turned that washing machine into a window of an airplane. And then the third image is she added some rainbows and whatever. Do you, do you want to see the rest of the copy? No, because that's it. That's, that, you win at that point. It doesn't matter what's written afterwards, if that makes sense. Yeah, amazing. The images really add a lot to it as well, which also takes away from the idea of the copy. It's like it's a complete package, right? That creates the emotion and creates the understanding. You teach a lot of these concepts. You go really deep into how to sell right in your in your in your community the copy thinkers community you have courses you have exercises you have weekly calls with you as you mentioned some roast calls some informative calls um how has the community evolved in its structure over time are there things that you're adding or taking away from it to make it more beneficial and also i'm curious how you think about communities like you have on school compared to maybe like cohorts or courses like just paid products for you know people with an audience so the second one is actually a more complex uh, question. So let's put it aside and come back to it. So let me tell you about how the community evolved. So basically what we did is we listened to people. And at the end of the day, we need to understand that people, a lot of times, and also in our market research for copy, people will usually not tell you the truth. Okay, because there is their face there. They're not anonymous. It's not ready. They have some relationship with the creator, for that instance, me. They have ego. They have fears. They will not tell you what actually is happening, right? So one thing we found out after we did an anonymous poll is that, by the way, uh, credit to Kyrie. Kyrie is the guy who helped us, helped us build this whole thing. Um, and so he did that anonymous poll. And one thing that we understood is that people are overwhelmed. People don't know what to do because there was so much. You know, we have right now, we have like 30, more than 30 recorded calls. Each one of those are about an hour and a half long. And then we have the structure in the community. And then we have the exercises and the discussion boards. And so people are like, what do I do? So what we did was we actually built out a plan for them. We took all the videos, all the things that we had in the community, and we put it into stages. We have, I think, or either nine or 10 stages. And we tell them, start here. They start there. And I'm a big believer in the fact that whenever you're building a course or whatever, start with your most um, aha moment thing. I want to give people an aha moment first, right? They're like, oh, no, okay, now I see why I joined this thing. And then it's easier going for them to consume the rest. 
because you, you know all those courses or like books where it's like first they tell you the backstory and then they talk about mindset right and then i never go through that stage of mindset i've heard i've heard tony robbins on youtube thank you very much i got his courses i don't want to hear in a in a email marketing course about mindset no i don't if you think it's crucial put it in the in the end start with something strong get people to believe into and this is another uh, big thing that i believe in what you are selling is actually not a product we're selling our philosophy that's what we're selling and if in that first moment in the course or the community i can show you my philosophy and you're like oh this guy's philosophy makes sense then everything else falls into place that's to answer your first question the second one is look community is just a different business model that's all it is and let me tell you right now everyone who is listening if you want to build a community you need to understand that the amount of work that you have to put into this is so much more than any course any cohort a cohort is a breeze compared to the community the number of people of working hands that you need in only to sustain to maintain the community going is enormous i could not do it myself i have a co-founder gd he's on top of all of that we have itai who is working with us we have Kyrie. we have other people helping us it's a lot of work and also it's unsustainable because if the goal is to make money you will not make money from a community unless you have 10 million followers people leave every month right the reason that i decided to lead with a community is because i wanted to spread the message this is more of a branding move than it is a, a make money move at the end of the day people buy into my philosophy they go on x and say oh my god copy thinking is crazy that's what i want to happen to, with this community that's why i started with a community interesting let me ask you a question because this is really fresh for me um two days ago so like okay so i've been building on x for a little while uh, particularly on money x and around social audio and things like that for about three or four months and i built a pretty good following people are really liking my mission my philosophy as you say around that voice can really uh, accelerate uh, you know a lot of your branding and your audience growth and your networking etc uh I, they've been urging me to create more things um, I've had a lot of things as I coach right now, I'm thinking about doing other products and services, but the other day we were on a space and kind of organically was like, let's start up a telegram. Like we need to get this off platform. So I launched a telegram and we spent like literally like eight hours just memeing each other in a telegram. And it was awesome. It's up to 200 people in the last two days and it's, it's on fire. What would you do right now if you have a buzzing community that really resonates with your philosophy? You're not monetizing them, but you basically, I basically can do anything I want at this point. Um, without, I know you don't have a lot of details about my situation, but I have this Telegram community. You're saying it's a lot of work. Um, what are some of the things I should really be paying attention to in the early stages? Well, first of all, I don't. Again, this is two questions, so let's 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 answer them separately. So regarding the community. I think there's a big difference between a free community and a paid one. And there's also a lot of difference in a Telegram community or a community that has more, right? Because, for example, you don't have content probably in the Telegram community. It's just a fun place to hang out, right? It's not like they go through a course or there is not, none of that. And again, because it's not paid, it's easy. But when it's a paid community, you always need to, you know, worry about whether the person uh, renews next month. So you need to provide a lot of uh, value. So uh, what you should pay attention to, I think you should pay attention to uh, what it is that you're trying to do in the long run. Because and this is something that uh, Pedro Martins, credit to Pedro Martins uh, on X again, this is something he, he taught me. A lot of us, and I've done that too, still doing that, and probably you are doing that, and most of us are doing that. We're focusing on the mi micro. We're focusing on the, I have 200 people in the community, what do I do? And Pedro keeps telling me, George, zoom out. What is the end goal here? And he did the same with me with the community. He's like, why do you keep focusing on the community? Like, that's awesome. You want to keep providing value, keep doing that. What is the bigger goal here? Right? So once you define that bigger goal, you know where you're going. So and when I say bigger goal, I don't mean, do you want to buy a house or do you want to buy a Ferrari? What I mean is, how do you want your business to look like? What are your boundaries? So for example, do you want to do one-on-one -on -one coaching? Some people don't. I don't. I don't want to spend my time one on one. So, okay, that's a red line, right? So within those red lines that you create for yourself, think out the funnel, think out the business. How do you want the business to look like? If that makes sense. Yep, totally. Um, I got a lot of thinking to do. It's exciting, but you're right. The paid and the, the free, that was one of the things I didn't want to do right away. Definitely as a paid community, because it, it involves so much and you have to, 
make sure that people get the value, right? That's really it. And I, I want to make sure I get the most. So with the telegram, it's a little more, um, I'm not as under the gun right away. Um, uh, with your community, I know, you know, when you first started, when you first launched it, uh, you had a sales page that you put up and JD, your partner told you, this doesn't sound like you, this doesn't feel like you, right? Um, you've described your tone of writing as more like arrogant or condescending. How did you land on that tone of voice and how much of it is authentic and how much of it is performative? Okay. A hundred percent of it is authentic. And I don't, I'm not one of those people who is like, oh, I'm listening to Matthew McConaughey. So I have to try to sound like him. I cannot see, even if I try to, although he's a cool guy and I wish I could be more like him in that term. Uh, I think that you need to be a hundred percent authentic. That's why I'm, I'm condescending. Now, when we say the word condescending, I don't mean that I'm actually condescending. I see people at this um, same level as me, right? But the way I speak is condescending. I don't know how it came about, right? And if you ask any of the almost 1,000 people in the community, nobody will say that George is condescending because they see just how much I give and how much I care. You know, we had so many live calls where my partner, JD, is saying, okay, it's an hour and a half. We need to go. I'm like, no, we have three more questions. We cannot leave those people unanswered. So I, I, I just kept going two and a half hours sometimes, right? So I very much care about that's how I am. That's my voice. I'm not trying to fight it. Instead, and this is something that I very much believe in. Instead of uh, hiding your negatives, use them. Because I would, I would not be me if that would not be my brand voice. I would not be me. I would be just another account with no hot takes, just another copy tip, another copy tip. That, people want an authentic relationship, an authentic connection to just be you, bottom line. It doesn't mean that being you has to, you have to say, I cried tonight because. No, you get to, to choose what you use and what you don't use. But with the things that you use, use yourself, even if it's negative. I've been using a lot of failure content, let's say, to get uh, a deeper connection with my audience. So like, these are all the things over the last five, six, seven years that I've failed at. And here's how I turned it into something good and you can too kind of thing. Um, and, and but leaning into a lot of personal stories, I think with the long form post, but in particular, have been a really good avenue for that. And you mentioned kind of like you're condescending, but it's not like you're mean. You do it in a way of like trying to inspire and just just get people's attention because you have a better a better a good intention for your you know for your actual content like for example i just posted a tweet right before we got on here that was basically like your short form copy sucks and here's why um and here's the things you can do but i literally said you're it sucks and it's like yeah that's condescending maybe but it's also like i'm just trying to get your attention so that i can actually help you you know can you help people with that because i think a lot of people they i've heard people say like i don't want to talk about myself i don't want to like be provocative i just want to like give advice and then kind of you know just offer that and walk away and i don't want to be like self-serving and egotistical i'm like you need to be like a, a bigger version of yourself you need to talk about yourself because otherwise you can't serve anyone because no one's paying attention to you yeah 100 percent. so um let me try to think how to answer that properly um, so first of all, here's, here's, uh, two quick tips for the people who are afraid of like voicing themselves to the maximum, right? Two quick tips. Number one, instead of saying, this is the best way to do something, just say, this is how I do something. And then the whole imposter syndrome, whatever it is, it just goes down because you're not, I, I, I'm never saying, or, or almost never saying this is the best course. Have you ever heard me saying this is the best community? No. This is my way to do what I preach. That's it. So that's number one. Number two, when you're talking about yourself, and that's actually a big one that I learned again in the copy world, um, people get annoyed when you talk about yourself from a point of view of success. It actually annoys people. So here's what you do. Um, you, once you switch to, to talking about yourself, you um, accredit it to luck or to something that is external, and then it doesn't annoy people. So for example, uh, up until I met the original Grammar Hippie, um, I used to write copy that flopped. It was awful, blah, 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 blah. And then I was lucky enough to meet this guy and blah, 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 blah. And then it disarms it, right? Because I was not lucky enough. I called this guy up and I chased him down and I'm like, I wasn't lucky, but if I say that, it's arrogant. Oh, George again, always gets what he wants, you know, banging on the chest, no. I was lucky enough to, to have that guy in my, in my life. So the way you frame things is important in that sense. And about talking about yourself, listen, 
this is not a uh, family gathering where you got some success in business and then the mom says, oh my God, my son is so amazing. And then the whole family knows. This is not one of those places. If you don't say it, nobody else will. Nobody else will tell your story. So, and if there is no story, there is no brand, there is no money, there is no, there's nothing. So you need to share your story. Just be careful about the words that you use, the framing of the thing. I love that. And it goes again, back to the intentionality of how you position yourself. And I want to dive into that a little bit because I've, I've heard you point out that there's, you know, maybe the, the large majority of accounts on X actually started on X rather than coming from like a marketing or a copy background. And so they're not as intentional. Can you describe like how people should be using top of funnel and medium of funnel and bottom of funnel content within X specifically and being intentional with their writing? Sure. What does that have to do with the first part that you asked of them coming to X without any experience? Yeah. So they don't really think of like their content on X as a marketing funnel and like bringing people Mm -hmm. like the top line stuff I've heard you talk about. It's kind of like maybe more of like the generic threads. And then you have stuff where you're going to tell more personal stuff and then you're going to lead them down into your products. Like, can you describe like those different types of content or how people can think about being intentional with their tweeting so that they have that end goal in mind with their audience? Sure. So first of all, I think that people who have no marketing experience or no, no experience what, about what they're going to talk about on X should not be on X. That doesn't mean delete your account. All that means is go out into the real world, get some results, get some experience so that when you come, you have something to say, right? Because otherwise you have nothing to say. Look, we're in, the, in an era where information is not enough. That information has to come from a unique lens of yours. That's what people buy. People buy the lens. They don't buy the content, whether it's free or paid. So that's about that. About the top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. So the way I look at it is this. Essentially, top of funnel is the first contact with a person, right? The first time you come in contact with a person. That has to be on X value. That has to be something interesting to the reader. How to do something, you know, how I did something, right? Here's the thing. Many accounts... um, what they do is they, so how, how many threads of those have you seen? 20 tips um, about marketing that I wish I knew, right? Tip number one, number two, number three. Essentially what happens is this whole thing is a top of funnel thing, right? Because there's no personality in it. 20 ways you can do this. Okay, so you say the 20 ways, even if I read, even if I follow you, I don't remember you the next day because I just read a hundred more threads and I followed a hundred more people. This is where middle of funnel comes into play. Middle of funnel is you yourself, your personality, your experience, your life, your philosophy. And that's what actually buys people into you. And that's what we're trying to do, right? You can have an, uh, how many accounts do we see on Twitter on X that are super valuable in terms, of, in terms of knowledge, but they cannot sell anything if their life dependent on it because that's just not enough. So what I do is I make sure to combine the two. So what is top of funnel? Top of funnel is the framing. Again, we're talking about the framing of the messaging, the hook, the first couple of tweets, whatever it is, if it's a thread. You want to frame it so it as, as broad as possible. Okay. You want to uh, potentially every single person who could potentially be in your target audience to be able to read it, to want to read it. Right? That's the framing. And then the moment you get into the actual content, what I do is I combine uh, me inside. So I've never written 23 marketing tips, maybe once. If I say marketing, I say, here's marketing 23 marketing tips that I learned during this. And then I tell my stories during those tips. So that at the end of the day, you still remember, okay, George, the story about the cybersecurity school that you said in the beginning, right? Uh, Of how my friend betrayed me. That's me, my story. I shared how I felt. I shared what happened to me, not just how we built a business. I shared myself. And then... People who actually follow me, they remember me. They care. They want to be a part of this story, of this journey that I'm telling. And then bottom of funnel happens on the list. I don't sell on social media ever. That's bottom of funnel. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, this goes in line with kind of what I was just talking about, that post I just put up about short form. I've been kind of ranting in spaces about this the past few days is that, um, you know, you mentioned it with the long form, which it could be like boring and just kind of like, here are the 10 things, whatever. And they, be, they could become kind of platitude because they're just recycled concepts that are not really that interesting, frankly. Um, 
particularly with the short form, it's really hard to get across a story. You do a great job with it, but most people, they just share like their business and life lessons in 280 characters and they try and be more like clever about it than they actually do by like adding context to it. So I think the long, the way I'm using long form right now is really, I can do platitudes and, and lessons at the bottom of a story, right? There needs to be context. There needs to be emotion. And then you can drive home like, and you know, networking is the best part. And that's why. And it's like, cause there's a whole story about how I used my podcast to get and George 10 on and now we are friends. Right. And it's like with the short form, it's really hard because you don't have that space to expand. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, Maybe there's like things even outside of your niche that you could talk about. Something you can create interesting conversation that, and you can use it as a tool where you're using, you know, your brand. You dive into the long form, maybe into the spaces. You're you're going expansive and you're telling stories. And then with the short form, maybe you can create interesting thoughts that don't even have to do with your niche. What do you think about that? Like adding content to your brand that's not necessarily focused on your offer or your target market, like specifically, but it makes you more of a well-rounded individual, like a multifaceted person and helps people connect with you. A hundred percent. And I do that all the time. I do that all because look, the way I see it is this. So we have the thread, right? We have the, the magnet, which gets people to follow you because at the end of the day, people are not going to follow you by talking about your life, right? Unless you're a life blogger, lifestyle blogger. So to me, the, that's a funnel. I get people into my, uh, into my funnel through top of funnel. And then inside the thread, it turns into the middle of funnel. And then what I try to do, so you will see that consistently on my account. After every thread of mine that actually went viral or got, got me a lot of followers, I'll start tweeting only personal stuff for like a day or two or almost. So for example, I know that, you know, those 20 year old kids were living in Dubai, driving a Ferrari and calling their uh, girl, girlfriend a hoe. You know those guys? I know two things about those guys. Number one, they're not going to buy from me. Number two, the reason for that is I don't want them to buy from me. We, our philosophies don't align. So I want to filter those people out. I want them to unfollow me. So you'll see me tweeting about my wife a lot of times because I know deliberately that I don't want those people to buy from me. I'm not going to be able to provide for them because I had this guy on, uh, on uh, one of our first calls in the copy thinking community who asked, how do I position a puppet, uh, puppet meal? That's the word. Um, word? like, um, like a place where, where they breed dogs. Oh, a puppy mill. Yeah. Yeah. Puppy mill. Right. And then I was like, I don't want to help you with that. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that idea. So go away. Right. I, I didn't try to, to, to insult him, but I'm like, okay, I did a bad, uh, filtering. I need to filter those people out. I don't want them to be in my community if, if, I, if we don't align, right? So that's where the personal content com comes into play. And again, listen, the moment people are glued to you because of your professional content, every single piece of content about yourself is going to be just as interesting and even more interesting because we all want to know what happens behind the, you know, President Biden. We want to know what happens in his family where we want to know what's inside because he's president. If you're not the president of at least of your little universe, nobody cares. I think the spaces are really interesting with that too, because you get to get, and you have it in your community where you, you know, you're live interacting with people. Uh, that live is really cool as well. Um, and I'm, I'm glad people are getting to see you. My audience is getting to see you here because bro, you got to tell me, um, I could not find any podcast that you were on. Uh, I even put First out one. a bounty really. Okay. I, I put out a bounty. I said, anyone that can find a George 10 podcast or interview. I did find that one space you did with Eddie Kwan in March on X. But other than that, I literally, and, and obviously all the stuff in your community, could not find one. So this, is that confirmed? This is your first podcast? First one. And I can tell you why also. I can tell you why if you want. Yeah, and I'd love to know why you decided to do it online. Sure. So here's why I didn't do it before. There's two reasons. Number one is because I'm not a public speaker and I had a, crazy public speaking fear. So when we, uh, with my business partner, JD, when we decided to first, uh, we first launched a cohort before the community. We wanted to know what people want, you know, so we launched the cohort. Six months before we launched it, I came to JD, my business partner, and I said, I don't think I can do that. He's like, listen, I can help you. Let's do, we did like tens of runs where I would just run through the content in front of him and he would be like, okay, slow down. Okay, this, okay, that. And then still, when I got in front of 10 people, 
um, I blacked out. The first the first call was crazy. I blacked out completely, and I started. I, I just stopped talking for a couple of minutes. So I had a crazy fear of that. That's number one. Number two is because I believe that those um, podcasts spaces they are targeted towards a higher quality audience. So to me, I'm very intentional about what I do. Like I said beforehand, I try to see the bigger picture. What am I trying to do? It's not only for fun. I very much enjoy talking to you, but it's not only for fun. So I'm asking myself, what am I trying to do? And those podcasts, think about it. Now people are listening to us and I'm in their ear for 41 minutes right now. Please don't stop watching if you didn't notice. Okay, keep keep listening. Good things are coming. Um, so that's, they buy into my philosophy very strongly and very quickly. But I don't need them to buy into my philosophy if I'm going to sell a $300 product. I don't need that. I need that if I'm going to sell a $5,000 product. So to me, it was important first to build out my funnel, and I'm still building it. And then when I have the 5K product, then this makes sense. Then, and this is one of the biggest advantages, and that's what you preach all the time on your ex. This is one of the biggest advantage, advantages of having a big account. Listen, if I build out my funnel, I don't tweet a single thing, but just by going on podcasts like yours, because you know me and I'm a big account and you would like to interview me, I can sell the crap out of my 5K product. I can make a million dollars in a month just by going every day on a podcast. So that's why I started doing it now. Honestly, you put me in a corner, sort of, thing, sort of speak, right? I, I didn't want to do it now. Uh, I really wanted to speak to you, but you know, I said, let's begin this journey, right? And I really love your content. And I really wanted to speak to you. I think that what you're doing on X is incredible. I think that the way I see the world, you know, each one of us has their own strategy to build and whatever. The way I see it, you've played every single card 100% on point the way I see it. So I'm like, okay, we're aligned. I want to speak to this guy. So that's why I'm here right now. Wow. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Um, just trying to put one foot in front of the other here and, and figure out how to do this thing. So that, coming from you, that means a whole lot. I got a few um, rapid fire questions for you. I've never really sure. done this, but, but I had a bunch of short ones. So I figured I would just fire them away. Um, I read somewhere that in 2015, you went vegan. I'm curious, are you still yeah. plant-based or did you go back? No, I went vegan for three years. I'm no longer vegan. It's just too difficult, although I do believe in the cause. Cool. Um, you blew up everyone's inbox when Kieran Drew first launched high impact writing and you went crazy with that. And that was fun. How many affiliate emails did you end up sending for him? Do you know? I don't remember. I think around 10, maybe 12, but here's a funny story about Kieran. The first day that he launched, he, we actually spoke before he launched, uh, gave him a piece of advice or something. And then we, he launched and he sent, I think two emails in the first day and he showed, he shared the result. He sent me a screenshot of how, how much money he made. And I was like. I'm sorry to tell you, brother, I think you can do more. Can we please try and see why you only made that amount of money in the first day? Um, he's like, yeah, sure. Ask away. And I'm like, how many emails did you send? He's like, two. I'm like, so basically you're telling me that I, as an affiliate, I'm going to send more emails about your product than you. I'm going to make more money from your launch than you, dude. And that's when he was like, oh, okay. And he started sending emails. So I sent a lot of, I don't know. I, I very much believe that when, when you're in a launch, because at the end of the day, listen, people on my list, people on your list, people on our list, they either buy or if they don't want to buy and they're staring, staying there for the stories, they'll stay. If I'm emailing too much, don't be on my list. Like that's my philosophy. I don't care. When I'm selling something, I want to make sure that I give you every possible angle, every possible belief, every possible story that you need to know in order to buy. I'm doing you a disservice. I cannot tell you how many people after the last launch DM'd me, emailed me after the launch. I missed your emails. Oh my God, what do I do now? And I'm like, dude, I sent like 20. How did you miss it? Oh, I was out with my family. Well, I said beforehand that I'm going to launch this weekend. Why didn't you read that? And so you're doing people a disservice if you don't bombard them with emails. They want what you're selling. Bombard them. That's what they want. Actually, I did another thing. I'm sorry. It's a quick fire. I'm sorry. I have to tell you this. Mm -hmm. I did another uh, a screw up of mine. I did not filter the lists. So people who were already in the community got all the emails for the next two launches. And at some point I asked people in the community, I I'm so sorry, should I remove you for from that list? Every single person inside the community said, don't remove me. I want to read your emails. Beautiful. That's the people I want on my list. If you're not that person, don't be on my list. Thank you very much. I love that. Um, it's a good philosophy. Um, I don't, I don't think you've ever had a blue check on X. Have you, you don't have one now. What's the reason for that? Um, I don't care. 
What if it helps you with reach and stuff like that? It just doesn't matter. Then I, I probably will at some point. That's just not my priority. I will. I, I have a bit of a different. I have a bit of a trouble with my uh, uh, Apple Pay. And it has to go through Apple Pay. My credit card is a previous credit card. And if I change it, I'm afraid that other subscriptions will go to waste. So I'm like, okay, I don't know. At some point, I'll do it. I don't... At the end of the day, listen. At the end of the day, and people ask me this a lot. I, I actually interviewed for uh, AOP's community, Art of Purpose community. And, and he asked me a question. He said, everyone in the room wants to know, what is the future of apps, do you think? And I'm like, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Because I'm not building on X. I'm building on me. If X goes down, I'm going to go to Instagram, I'm going to TikTok, I'm going to go to YouTube, I'm going to go offline, I'm going to open a brick and mortar store. It doesn't matter. Invest in you, everything else doesn't matter. So that's just a quick uh, thing. Okay. I will get I, it at some point. I think you can pay on web and it's actually cheaper. So you might not have to deal with Apple Pay. You can just put your credit card really? in. And Beautiful. I think, and that's they're actually, <laughs> and they're actually adding, I think, <laughs> um, more functionality for a higher tier payment now. So you're going to get a lot of extra stuff and then you could turn on subscriptions. So that way you'd be able to monetize even there. Um, maybe do some subscriber only stuff. So there's some options. Um, but yeah, I think you can get around Apple pay if you do it on web, of course. Um, okay. your first, your first Twitter post ever, I don't know if you remember this was a long thread, a long educational thread. Your first Facebook post ever in 2016 was a giveaway for a Facebook groups, uh, cheat sheet. Have you ever used social media for fun or for pleasure or for personal stuff? Or has it always been for business? Okay. So um, the Facebook account that you saw was actually a business Facebook account because my personal, uh, my personal Facebook account got closed. So I was doing some things in one of my e-commerce stores a long time ago, and I broke some rules without knowing that I'm breaking those rules. One of them was um, we sold Rick and Morty t-shirts. And that's a copyrighted uh, thing. I didn't know that, so they closed my account. I'm not interested in social media as a way to connect with people other than people that I meet in the business world, which now became great friends of mine. I don't believe in social media as a way to keep in touch with your family, freaking, freaking call them. And if you have a friend, freaking come to Spain, man, let's sit here and drink a beer. I don't believe in that sharing my personal life just for people to see with no purpose. I, I don't like that. So no, I use it for business. Got it. Um, yesterday was your birthday. Is that right? How do, how do you know that? Because I'm smart. What did you do? Did you do anything fun? Yes. We went to, my wife got me a bunch of presents. We went to a restaurant. We went traveling a bit. We actually wanted to go to Hungary, but something happened with a plane ticket. So we did it here. I'm in Valencia now. Awesome. I don't well, know happy. how you knew that it was my birthday, by the way. I, I purposefully didn't publish that anyway. Well, so that's welcome you. to the podcast. <laughs> Uh, um, and then, yeah, so, uh, what are you, I'm curious, finally, what are you most excited about right now? Um, not just with business, but with life, like what really has your attention and, and what get, what makes you happy and fulfilled? Um, I'm, I'm one to be known to have no boundaries when it comes to business. My hobby is business. That's what I think about 24 seven. I love that. I love my wife. I love my family. You know, that's a big, big why for me. But I'm, I'm excited about business when I got, you, you know, I've been, I've been doing copywriting for like 12 years now and I would get home after, you know, office or whatever. And I would pick up a book. I would try to dissect, uh, dissect copy. I read ads. Like that's my hobby. That's what I'm excited about. And then right now we're building a product uh, called the belief matrix. Um, and that product is going to be all about beliefs, um, how to sell through beliefs, how to upsell through beliefs. It's a beautiful product. So. That's what I'm doing right now. And I'm super excited about that because I think that that could add a ton of value to my community members and everyone else. I think people will enjoy that. And I'm really excited about that right now. I love that you're obsessed with your craft and that's why you're the best at what you do. I think it's a testament to all the success you've had. And also everybody should be looking at that and, and understanding that you really have to love what you do because there's so much ups and downs and it's very difficult and the, the motivation is fleeting. Uh, but if you love it, you'll push through and, and you put other people before yourself in a lot of ways, like the way you just said, that's like, this is going to bring so much value to people. Uh, it's a great way to look at it. So George, I'm super, super grateful that you joined my show, especially that it's your first one ever. That's so cool. Um, I really appreciate the time and the attention and the detail. Um, your answers were really eye opening, And I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And 
Uh, if you have anything that you want to promote, uh, I would love you to do that. I'm going to have all the links in the description for everybody to check out. Um, and then maybe if you have like one uh, thought of encouragement or inspiration for people that are just getting going with their personal brands, that would be awesome. Sure. So uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. You've been amazing. I love what you do. Uh, I, I love this interview. Um, about promoting just, hey, come to Twitter, join the list. Like I'm not selling anything right now. I didn't come here to sell anything, you know. Um, at least not right now. And about a uh, word of encouragement, listen, um, I grew up in a, I don't want to say poor family because I hope that my mom and dad will not see that, but in a family where we didn't have a lot of resources for anything. And I heard my whole life, uh, my mom and dad arguing about money. And hey, even now, when I go join my parents, I, I went there like a couple of years ago. I went a lot, but a couple of years ago, I went and I ordered a pizza. And then my dad saw that and he was like, what, we have no food at home? Let me tell mom, maybe she'll make you something. Why do you spend money on food, right? So that's the mindset that I came from. I came, it's not only that I didn't have resources, I didn't have anyone to call to, to help me, to teach me, to get you, me into university. I didn't have any resources. I built everything myself. I was lucky enough to understand early on when I was in network marketing that personal development is the thing, the thing. I used to wash floors. I used to, used to collect uh, beer bottles. I came from a really, really very bad place and very bad mindset. You know, my dad keeps telling me to this day, there's nothing, I, unlike a lot of other parents, I can leave you nothing because I have nothing. And I tell him, dad, thanks for telling me that sentence all those years that made me go and get what I want and not rely on you. So this is my word of encouragement to everyone. You know, we hear stories, Russell Branson, we hear stories of people, you know, and we're always like, well, yeah, but they can and I cannot. No, you freaking can. I'm not more smart. I'm not more intelligent. I'm not more anything. I'm not more connected. I just went, put my head down and went to freaking work. And if you do that, there is no, I, I used to ask myself all the time, will this bring any fruits? Will I ever be successful? Will I ever be able to make some normal money? Like I asked that every single night I would go to sleep with that thought. Let me tell you right now, I know that for sure. And I've heard mentors telling me that 12 years ago. And I'm going to tell you the same thing to you. There is no way that the universe will not bend backwards if you go and get what you want. It will bend all around you as much as you want it to bend. Just make one decision and go that direction. By the way, if you want a great audiobook recommendation, The Greatest Secret by Earl Nightingale, that book changed my life. And this is, it's exactly about what I'm talking about right now. You can do it. If you decided you can, you can do it, regardless of the circumstances, I don't care where you live. I don't care what language you speak. I don't care how much money you have or don't. I don't care if you have 10 kids that you need to provide for and you're working three jobs. I don't care. Decide and you will get it if you keep going that direction. That's my message. Amazing, dude. I think we could go for another hour on that topic, but I'm going to let you go. Uh, and thank you so, so much for that. Uh, amazing. You're making a really big impact and I appreciate your time, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. It's been amazing.